What if? What if Zion Lutheran Church was known throughout the communities of Redmond, Bend, and beyond as a church where the gospel was preached, where the lost are found, where believers are equipped, where the needy are served, where the lonely are enfolded into a community, and where God gets the credit for it all. What if we were that kind of church? Wouldn't that be the kind of church that you'd be passionate about? Wouldn't that be the kind of church where you'd like to become more involved and even invite your friends to come with you? Wouldn't that be the kind of church that blesses our Redmond community, but also Bend and Primeville, Madras, Crooked River Ranch, and beyond? What if we could become that kind of church even more and more? Well, in order to even think about that, it's, it's important to ask three questions. First, why do people need Jesus? Why do people need Jesus? Why do people need the church? And why specifically do people need Zion Lutheran Church? When Jesus said in our gospel for today, um, from Matthew 16, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not overcome it. He was suggesting that Jesus is the builder of the church. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation of a church. And when a church is built in Jesus' name, that even the powers of hell and Hades and sin, death, and the power of the devil is not able to overcome it. Jesus says it's built on a confession of the name of Jesus. When Jesus asked his disciples, you know, who do the guys out there say I am? They said, well, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, on this, on this rock, on this foundation of the confession of the name of Jesus is what I will build my church. So what if? Zion Lutheran Church was known through Redmond, Bend, and beyond as a place where the gospel is preached, where the lost are found, where believers are equipped, where the needy are served, where the lonely are enfolded into a community, and where God gets the credit for it all. What if? You know, in order to do that, we need to think about what defines Zion Lutheran Church, because like it or not, Churches are defined by something, whether it's a conscious choice or not. Churches, seriously, churches like people have a personality. They have a feel when you go into that church, a feel, a personality that drives them and defines them. What drives, what defines, what's the personality of Zion Lutheran Church? Some churches are defined or driven by traditions, traditions that go way back, long and deep. When I was a, a, a worked with youth as an associate pastor at a large church in, in Minneapolis, I quickly found out that there were many traditions that drove the church, especially in the area of youth ministry. On my first Sunday there, a distinguished gentleman came up to me and said, Pastor Eric, it's great to have you here. Just remember that we have a lot of traditions in our youth program that are very important to very many people. <laughs> and then he says, don't try to change a thing. <laughs> Sipped his coffee and walked away. It was a church driven by tradition. Other churches are driven by the personality of the pastor who usually has been there long enough to have a great big 10-foot picture of the pastor and his spouse prominently displayed in the fellowship hall, and the church is referred to Pastor Dale's Church. <laughs> Other churches are driven by constant talk of money, especially if it's a church that has had a recent building program where every Sunday you come to church and you're encouraged to give more and more, and even your firstborn to pay off the mortgage. <laughs> Other churches are driven by being social activists, where you come to church and you walk through the narthex in the fellowship hall, and there's constant talk about food shelves and migrant farm issues and bread for the world and Palestinian freedom and a whole other host of, of causes that they're supporting. Other churches are driven by committees. 
Seriously, one church I served was so proud that they had 42 committees. And I was really impressed, 42 committees, until I found out that the purpose of the committees were to be advisory committees to tell other committees what to do. Um, one, I worked with youth there, and when the youth committee wanted the youth bathroom painted, pretty simple thing, the property committee told them not to spend over $8.99 on a gallon of paint. The women's committee told them to make sure that whatever color it was, that it matched the mauve palette that they had chosen for all of the bathrooms in the church. The facilities committee said, you spill on the floor, you're going to buy a new floor. And it kind of went back and forth, and the committees chimed in until two years later, and the bathroom still wasn't painted. You know, I'd like to suggest that there's marks of a healthy church. There are definable marks of a healthy church that can be defined, enhanced, and focused on to bring about a healthy congregation. What if Zion Lutheran Church were known throughout Redmond, Bend, and beyond as a healthy church? A healthy church where the gospel is preached, the lost are found, believers are equipped, the needy are served, the lonely are unfolded into a community, and God gets the credit for it all. That's what we're going to be focusing on these weeks in September and October until we get to Reformation Sunday, Reformation reforming the church, I'd suggest, around these marks of a healthy church as we look forward to the future. You see, I would like this next decade of life and faith and ministry here at Zion to be a decade of church health. I would like 20 years from now for the people of Zion to look back at the decade between 2010 and 2020 as a decade of faithfulness, of spiritual growth, of commitment, and of church health. Now that's not necessarily going to come from focusing only traditions on the past or the personality of the pastor. I mean, you'd lose big time with that one. Or focusing just on money, social concerns, or a bunch of committees. It's going to focus, it's going to come from focusing on Jesus and the building of his church, the church of Jesus, so that the powers of hell, death, sin, and the power of the devil will not prevail against it. I would like this decade, this next decade, to be a faithful and fruitful and healthy, great decade in the history of Zion Lutheran, in the life of Zion Lutheran Church. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. <laughs> if you would have said no, I would have you know, just kind of sat down. <laughs> you know, it can be a great, healthy decade. And as we think about this next decade that lies in front of us, let me recall with you just for a moment as we think about this next, I think, healthy, great decade at Zion Lutheran Church. Let's remember for a moment the greatest decade in American history. The greatest decade in American history, the 1970s. Remember the 1970s? I mean, wasn't that the greatest decade ever? I mean, think of the hair we had back then, you know? I went for a full year without getting my hair cut. I had great sideburns, Fu Manchus. I mean, how could you beat that? And the cars back in the 70s, I drove a 1966 GTO, you know, 389 four barrel Ford, T-Bar, great car, four miles to the gallon. <laughs> remember back in the 70s, the AMC Gremlin, you know, remember you got the back off a station wagon, what a great idea, or the AMC Pacer, remember the bubble windows on those things, I mean, I thought George, the George Jetson was driving it the first time I saw it, I thought they're going to make those things until I die, how could a futuristic car like that get old, and the clothes, you're too young to remember the clothes, but they were so Cool, platform shoes, bell bottoms, clogs, leather fringe perches, tube tops, baby blue tuxedos with that frilly stuff. And remember the greatest piece of clothing ever invented? The polyester leisure suit? <laughs> I mean, those, some of you guys still have them in your closet. And those are, those were, yeah, yeah, those were so, 
You could wrinkle them up in a ball, put them in a bag, and take them out, and they look like they just came from the cleaners. I mean, they were, and the music. I mean, Elton John, Billy Joel, Three Dog Night, the guitar licks from Boston, ZZ Top, Barry Manilow. Oh, I know, not Barry Manilow, sorry. Bee Gees, you know, from Saturday Night. And who could forget the greatest song ever written? I mean, remember that one? Let's sing it together. When I find myself missing the culture that's right in front of us. 
Our churched, unchurched culture of the Pacific Northwest isn't killing us because more people don't go to church in the Pacific Northwest than any other part of the country. That's not killing us. Rather, for many churches, our grief over the passing of those days of the 1950s and our inability, inability to get past that grief is killing us. We need to remember that just because the 1950s church culture served us well back then doesn't mean that it'll serve us now. Everybody doesn't go to church. In fact, as every year passes, fewer and fewer people, a percentage-wise, attend, fewer and fewer attend American mainline churches. The percentage of people who do not attend church has doubled, who do not attend church has doubled in the last five, in the last 15 years. Only one in 10 American mainline churches are growing. That means that 90% of American mainline churches are in decline. Um, 10,000 churches in America have disappeared over the last 10 years. Think of this, 20%, according to a statistic I wrote, 20% of American, especially mainline churches, have no future. And 90%, Sunday school begins today and confirmation will be beginning in, in a couple of weeks, 90% of the young men who are raised in church, 90% of them will likely abandon the church in their 20s. 90% of them. Many of them will not return. Many, many American mainline churches are not in, not only in a state of decline, but in a, in, a, in a condition of ill health. Many, many American mainline churches are rapidly deteriorating, and some have already been put on life support and are not expected to survive. What if? What if Zion Lutheran Church was known throughout Redmond, Bandon, and beyond to, I mean, think of this, within 30 minutes drive of Zion Lutheran Church live about 180,000 people within a 30 minute drive of where we live. What if we were known throughout that community as a place where the gospel is preached, where the lost are found, where believers are equipped, where the needy are served, where the lonely are enfolded into a community? and where God gets the credit for it all. That's what we're going to be talking about during September and October, because I really do believe that the best years of Zion Lutheran Church lie in front of us, and that we need to get over our grief over the passing of the 1950s and move into the vibrant future that God has in store for us. I'm convinced that Zion Lutheran Church is in a very unique position to be able to move through these years as a vibrant and healthy and evangelical church that, yes, honors the past, but also creatively visions for a, congregations that, a congregation that knows that people need Jesus and that becoming a part of our worshiping and discipling community, people come to know Jesus. I think it's really important to do what it takes, do whatever it takes to get the Jesus thing done. And so the question we need to ask ourselves as we, is, as we go forward is, is what we're doing reaching people who do not yet know Jesus? Is what we're doing getting the Jesus thing done? Is the gospel being preached? Are the lost being found? Are believers being equipped? Are the needy being served? Are the lonely being enfolded into a community? And is God getting the credit for us all? Those I think are the questions that we need to ask ourselves on this rally day as we look forward to a new and exciting year in ministry where we, by the grace of God, can live into the future that God has laid in front of us with the marks of a healthy church. In Jesus' name, amen.